and action. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Howdy, folks. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 2, page 16. Nice. Here, as always, is Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich, welcoming you to the Dune Steve. This week, our story is When the Stars Are Right by William Meikle. William Meikle is a Scottish writer now living in Canada with nine novels published in the horror and fantasy independent press and short story credits in 13 countries and six languages. His most recent sales are to the current Wrong World DVD anthologies, Choices, and Inflation. He has also had four short films produced from his scripts, with four more currently in production. When the Stars Are Right by William Meikle Taken from the tape journal of Megan Dowell's consultant historian, USS Paul DeCane, tape number one. 11.45 11.45 p.m. August 1st, 2045. Hello, darling. I'm settling in okay here, but I wish I was at home with you. You might have seen me on the link talking to that snotty newsman. Don't believe a word of what they've said. I've been promised that my role here is purely as a consultant. All the rest is just scaremongering. The ship is really impressive. Remember all those old 2D films with the flying saucers? Well, they've actually gone and built one took my breath away when I first saw it from the viewing deck of the Asimov. It's nearly 50 meters in diameter and 10 meters high at the edges. It looks silver, shiny, and mean. If you can imagine looking down on it as it is decked, my berth is at 9 o'clock, almost halfway in towards the center. Everything looks and smells new. Antiseptic, like a hospital. The room is pretty small, only about 2 meters square with most of that being taken up by the bed at the moment. I've been told that it folds away, transforming itself into a desk and a seat, but I'm too shagged out after the trip to do anything other than sleep. I'll drop you another line tomorrow. Maybe by then I'll know what all the rush was about. I'm still unsure as to why they need a medieval scholar on a high-tech piece of equipment like this. Give my love to the kids. Miss you. Tape number two, 11.02 p.m., August 2nd. 2045. This has got to be the weirdest thing that has ever happened. If I'm to explain it to you, I'll have to give some history, so bear with me. It might not seem relevant at first, but all will become clear. I promise you, you won't believe it. I'm not sure I do, and I'm in the middle of it. We were called into the conference room after breakfast. Breakfast was fine, by the way. None of that reconstituted goo you expect space people to eat. I had real eggs, tomatoes, and freshly squeezed orange juice. The general stood at the top of the table as the twelve of us entered. He looks a lot like your father. Stiff, straight, and uptight. He doesn't smile much, and when he does, it never reaches his eyes. I wouldn't like to mess with him. He told us that what we were about to see was highly classified, and that all communications home would have to be censored. I don't know how much of this will be let through, but here goes anyway. It seems the whole thing began in the 1990s. The general reminded us that people back then didn't have holovids, and that what we were to see was a reconstruction. It looked lifelike enough to me. The vid began with a Brit scientist, Thompson. It seems he was a research physicist who also dabbled in parapsychology. There was a lot of stuff about his academic career and background which turned me off, but then it finally got to the good bit. Thompson had a theory that paranormal events were associated with the production of energy, a new form of energy which, as yet, had not been investigated. At this point, the vid went off into a long explanation about particle physics and the space-time continuum. I switched off. You know how I am with that kind of stuff. I wondered what the relevance of it all was, but I was snapped back to the vid when it went to 2D. They were showing a scene from an old movie where these three guys managed to catch ghosts in a little oblong box. Seemingly, Thompson had got the inspiration from the film and had been able to build some sort of containment chamber for paranormal energy. Sounds weird, doesn't it? Don't worry, it gets worse. 
By using his box of tricks, he was able to prove that a small amount of electromagnetic energy was produced during these events. The vid showed him holding a meter. The meter was going crazy, while in the background something invisible was throwing pots and pans around the kitchen. The crazy little sucker had a huge grin spread all over his face. Have you guessed where this is leading yet? I'll give you a night to think about it. I'm going to stay up a bit longer. They're showing the holovid version of Alien tonight. I've never watched it during the trip before. I wonder if I'll get any sleep afterwards. I hope they allow this to get through. Hope you are keeping well. All my love. Tape number three, eight sixteen a.m., August third, twenty forty-five. Morning, sweetheart. What with that and the hollow vid yesterday, I didn't sleep much. I suppose I better put you out of your misery and get on to the really unbelievable bits. Thompson's work caused quite a stir. Any new form of energy was pounced upon quickly back in the 1990s. Of course, it was all kept quiet. Can you imagine the outrage if it had been publicized? There seems to have been two main groups involved in research, one in the States and one at Oxford University. The one in the States had the first success. They managed to produce a battery to store the power released. There was only one major problem. One apparition only gave enough power to run a light bulb for about an hour. It seemed that Thompson's discovery was of no practical use. After all, there was only a limited amount of known apparitions to go around. This is where the Oxford connection comes in. You know how the Brits have always been interested in spooks and the things that go bump in the night? Well, one bright spark had the idea of linking Thompson's machinery with a seance. That's where the real breakthrough came. The Holovid showed the whole thing with remarkable clarity. The seance had been going on for six minutes with no reaction from the meters. Then suddenly, just as the planchette began to move, the machinery went wild. Meters overloading, cameras running at double speed, people screaming. Pure pandemonium, but funny to watch. It was calculated later that enough energy was released to keep the average household going for a year. This all happened round about the turn of the century, and since then things have gotten really wild. I'll have to tell you about them later duty calls. We've been promised that we'll find out what we're here for. I'll give you an update later. Tell Sean not to worry about his math exam. I'm sure he'll pass it with flying colors. Oh, and do remind Jenny to send me a new painting. Her primary colors would do wonders for the walls of this room. All my love forever. Compiler's note. Tape 4 has been lost. It is presumed to have contained details of the UCLA disaster of 2015. Interested parties are referred to the Journal of Parapsychology, Volume 112, 5, pages 127 to 162, where a full account of the matter may be found. Tape number 5, 818 AM, August 4th, 2045. As you can imagine, they were none too keen to continue their experiments after the fiasco. The work was ostensibly dropped, but all that happened was that the military took over. After all, they are always interested in anything with potential for mass destruction. They quickly realized that any further experiments would have to be done away from large cities, so a test center was set up in Death Valley. You know, where all the interesting stuff we never hear about goes on. They also realized that they had stumbled onto something which would have worldwide ramifications. Naturally, they kept quiet. Current thinking is that they are experimenting with a gateway to another dimension. The greater the strength of the summoned entity, the more powers leaked through. And the general had to reassure us that what we were seeing was not a reconstruction. This is what actually happened. The first thing we saw was an empty room. Empty, that is, except for a pentagram seemingly etched on the floor. That's right. A pentagram. From out of the view to the left came a figure dressed in black, long, flowing robes like a monk. As he lifted his cowl, you could see that he was no more than 25 years old. His hair was cut military style, and his gait was stiff and straight as he strode into the pentagram. A readout in the bottom left showed us the state of the battery cells which would capture any released power. I recognized the right almost immediately. It came from the grimoire of Honorius, widely discredited amongst people who study such things and dangerous to boot. I won't bore you with the details. If you want to know about it, look it up on the vid. It's filed under ceremonial magic, but the version they were using is supposedly capable of summoning an imp or a minor demon. Ten minutes into the scene, after seemingly interminable rantings in Latin, something actually began to happen. We couldn't see anything, but the battery started registering. 
only a minor flicker at first, but then a steady, rising indication of power flooding the room. The camera operator must have noticed something that we hadn't. He panned into a spot on the floor six feet in front of the would-be necromancer, a spot just outside the pentagram. The floor was beginning to bulge, like someone struggling underneath a thin blanket. The meters on the batteries were now going wild, rising upwards towards 100% capacity. The camera snapped back to the floor, just in time to catch the sight of a long, taloned arm breaking through, a red arm which had too many joints and far too many fingers. Serrated talons dragged on the floor, screeching, setting my teeth on edge as the arm struggled for leverage. A shoulder began to appear as the floor bulged, its surface melting like hot wax. Out of the corner of my eye, I caught sight of the young man stepping backwards away from the sight, stepping out of the pentagram. There was a blinding flash of golden light, which forced me to look away from the vid. When my eyes had recovered, I looked back, but the room was empty. Only the empty pentagram and the meters were visible. The meters read 100% capacity. The general had to stop the session to give us time to assimilate all this. During the break, I began to realize how serious this was for me, and I wasn't happy about it. We were called back half an hour later. That's when my fears were confirmed. They had found out, after some trial and a lot of error, I suppose, that it was not feasible to use the power they had generated on Earth. We were given a long talk by a NASA engineer on the physics of propulsion before they got to the real meat. This ship is a prototype. It seems that they've found a way to utilize the power in propelling a ship through space ten times more efficiently and five times faster than anything else known. Or so they think. The drive has been built around a new generation of batteries which currently stand empty in the central core. They want me to power them up. They want to go to Mars. They want me to conjure them up a demon. Compiler's note, tape 6 has been omitted. It contains only personal matters not relevant to the mission. Anyone wishing access should contact NASA Records Office 7.12. Tape number 7, 11.39 p.m., August 5th, 2045. Hello again, sweetheart. The situation keeps getting more and more strange. I spent most of today on the computer... You're really going to have trouble believing this. They have discovered that a summoning could be done using a hologram for the summoner, as long as it's placed inside the pentagram. I suppose it means that they don't lose so many volunteers. They want me to tell the computer which spell to use for the summoning, and then, after the power cells are fired up, how to banish whatever it is we manage to call up. I told the general about my misgivings concerning dabbling in demonology, but he doesn't believe in demons. He thinks that we're tapping into another dimension. He believes that mankind has known about it for a long time, but has cloaked it in religious ceremony and symbolism to preserve the secret. I hope he's right. Maybe there is a scientific rationale, but I'm worried. Very worried. I think you'll like Dean, the computer engineer. He has a wicked sense of humor and a great talent for mimicry. His takeoff of the general made me laugh out loud for the first time since I left you. The hologram necromancer was his idea. I think he was surprised as anyone when it worked in tests. He tells me that they have tried the Honorius Rite on eight occasions now, the last two with the hologram. Before that, they lost six men. He personally designed the hologram. He calls it Crowley, but to me it looks like Gandalf. You know the type. Pointed hat, long beard, and piercing eyes. Looks like a maniac. Dean showed me the chamber where it will all happen. At the moment, it is empty apart from a six-foot circle in the middle. This circle is a thin sheet of 24 karat gold, just waiting to be etched with the pentagram I decide on. Uh, I must go. There's someone at the door. Take care. Love you. Tape number 8, 8.47 a.m., August 6th, 2045. Sorry about the cutoff last night. It was a new arrival on board and he wanted to see me urgently. Get this, he's from the Vatican. Cardinal John Doherty, exorcist. Do you believe it? An exorcist in 2045? He said he'd been asked in person by the Pope to get himself on board in case of emergencies. Anyway, to cut a long story short, he's very well versed in the literature and we stayed up swapping stories and drinking his whiskey until around three this morning, finally deciding to work together on the summoning. I feel a little hungover, but not too bad. 
Today, John and I have to decide what demon we try to summon. I thought he would be completely against the whole idea, but it seems he wishes to see what happens. He's got a strong Irish brogue, and he said to me in his mocking way, I've never met a prince of hell yet that could stand up to an Irishman in a fair fight. How do you like my attempt at an Irish accent? Pitiful, eh? I better go. I think I need a couple of black coffees before facing the day. Kiss, kiss. Love you. Tape number 9, 11.35 p.m., August 6th, 2045. Working seems to bring some stability to this crazy mess. John and I spent the morning with the computer going through the literature. We have a theory. Considering that the experiments so far have yielded enough energy to power a small town, if we conjure up a fully-fledged demon, we should be able to power the ship. John's got some ideas on the subject. He reminded me of Great Cthulhu, a major league player amongst the ancient pagan gods. John has access to some of the forbidden books. The Vatican seems to be jam-packed with them. Makes you wonder about the piety of some of the archbishops. I can imagine them scurrying to the forbidden books for a quick thrill after matins. Anyway, John has seen the Necronomicon and even shown me a couple of facsimile pages. He reckoned that Cthulhu is worth 50 dukes of hell on his own and has worked out the amount of time we'd have to have him in the chamber to power up the batteries. Neither of us believe a word of it, of course, but he thinks that the general will be very impressed by the figures. We adjourned at lunchtime to the wreck area. After the first day's breakfast, the food has gotten worse. We now get subjected to the reconstituted gooey stuff. I should have known it was too good to last. The more I think about it, the more surreal the whole thing becomes. Am I really trying to conjure up a demon to power a spacecraft? Sometimes I think that it is all an elaborate joke at my expense. Any minute now, a horde of laughing, shrieking colleagues are going to descend on me, awestruck at my gullibility. At other times, especially when I meet John Stare, I am more frightened than I have ever been. Later in the afternoon, we chose a summoning rite, deciding on one from the Mad Arab's book. Look it up on the vid if you want some gruesome entertainment. It details all kinds of paraphernalia which is deemed necessary, but John is adamant that only the words in the pentagram count. Just as well, really. I can do without the nails from the dead child's coffin or the candles made from human flesh. I couldn't even pronounce most of the words in the spell, but John was more capable. I wondered again about what really goes on in the Vatican. We passed our decision on to Dean, who programmed it into the computer, then shared a drink as we watched the robo-arm etch the pentagram into the gold disc, first cutting the fine grooves and then depositing hairline tracks of silver into the etched markings. The general was very happy to note that the battery started charging as soon as the pentagram was complete. One last thing, Dean was looking pleased with himself all afternoon. When I asked him why, he showed me what he'd done to the hologram of the summoner. It still looks maniac. But now it has my face. We do it tomorrow. Tape number 10, 12.30 p.m., August 11th, 2045. Hello, sweetheart. Well, I'm still alive. They tell me that you insisted on being kept informed, but I wanted to drop you a line to let you know that I'm okay. Just a bit shaken up. I suppose you want to know what happened. I'm not too sure myself. It all came so fast, but I'll tell you what I think occurred. It will be best if I start off slowly. Things get a bit hectic at the end. Picture it. A circular room about five meters in diameter. In the center is the pentagram. I'm off to the left in the control room with Dean, and we have an observation window about five feet square looking into the room. Opposite me, I can see the general and John looking in from a similar window. I know that in a room to the left of us, the remainder of the crew are following proceedings on the vid. Dean is waiting to be given the nod by the general. I can see a bead of sweat running along the crease between his nose and his cheek. The battery meters show a slow but steadily climbing charge. He gets the nod from the general and starts twiddling the buttons on the console. The summoner appears in the center of the pentagram, feet first. In the space of five seconds, it builds to the tall wizard, my face leering back at me through the window. Dean twiddles a few more buttons and the wizard sweeps his sword around the circle. He waits for another signal from the general. The bead of perspiration is now teetering on his mustache. I can see that the meters are rising faster. The general nods his head. Dean pushes another button and the summoner begins. 
A voice begins the harsh, guttural chant, and although I know the words, they are spoken too quickly for me to comprehend them. Across the room, I can see John mouthing the spell, keeping in time with the computer. Otherwise, the silence is as deep as can be. A rock barong Cthulhu fathong, Cthulhu relay for hingi la, la Cthulhu, la Cthulhu. Twenty seconds pass. The computer stops chanting. The meters stop rising. The bead of sweat falls off Dean's chin to the floor. The general is glaring at me. I turn away, mostly in relief, but I get distracted by a movement near the pentagram. As if from a great distance, I can hear a cry, like a wounded seagull. To Kaylee Lee! To Kaylee Lee! And behind that, a manic piping, a crazed flutist who plays in a flurry of cacophonous discordances. Dean touches my arm. He too has seen the movement. The meters start to rise, more rapidly this time. At a point midway round the room between us and the other window, the walls start to bulge and flatten. Bulge and flatten. The wall stretches and tears as easily as a piece of newly rolled dough. An arm appears, and appears, and appears. It is three times as long as a human arm, with texture similar to that of a rhinoceros hide. There is an extra joint between the wrist and the elbow, and six-inch talons on each of the seven fingers. I notice that the meters are going crazy, passing 50, then 60% capacity as I watch. The shoulder end of the arm is now being pushed through the wall, followed by the beginnings of a torso. Looking across the room, I see John is in an argument with the general. A movement catches my attention. I look round to see the wizard slipping across the pentagram. I look down and see that Dean has become distracted by the demon's entrance and has allowed the image to wander. I tap him on the shoulder. He starts, looks at me, and twists the button. Too far. The wizard leaves the pentagram. And all hell breaks loose. The demon pushes the top half of his body through the wall. Try to imagine an ugly, wart-ridden toad with a set of teeth like a shark. Now try imagining it with a three-foot-wide head. Got that? Now imagine it smiling, a Cheshire cat grin which is all teeth and saliva and rotting gums. And around the mouth, like a grotesque beard, hang a myriad of dancing tentacles, each with their own fang-filled mouth, each screaming in time to the meters. The meters are going wild, 80, 90, 100% as I watch. Across the room, the general is trying to catch Dean's attention. Dean is trying to maneuver the wizard back into the pentagram with little success. The demon is beginning to pull the rest of its body through the wall. I can see what looks like a segmented tail starting from where you'd expect the legs to be. The lower half of its body oozes a trail of gray pulsating slime as it slides into the room. The interior of the room is beginning to glow golden. The demon has pulled 10 meters of tail from the wall and it shows no sign of tapering towards the end. Its bulk dwarfs the hologram of the wizard, towering over it, dripping saliva to the floor where it hisses and boils like water on a hot griddle. I can barely see the other window, only enough to notice that the general is now holding John, as if to stop him from doing something. I press the button to begin the banishment, more in hope than in anything else. As the voice begins, the demon looks straight at me. His eyes are golden and pierce me into stillness. A blue electric discharge snaps noisily from the talons on his left hand, running around the walls of the room, dancing across the walls. I lean forward towards Dean, but it's too late. The electric shock flings him backwards against the wall where he falls, slumped as if in a stupor. I can see that the demon has now pulled the whole of its body into the room. I try to get control of the wizard, which seems to have baffled the demon when I realize that the banishment spell is still being broadcast. The demon gives up trying to grab the hologram and studies it instead. It lifts that huge broad head and looks straight at me. I see from the corner of my eye that three smaller redder arms are beginning to push their way through the wall, groping blindly for purchase. The demon makes a move in my direction, but something stops it. As it turns I see, behind it, that John has entered the room, crucifix raised. He's saying something, but the noise from the banishment spell and the ever-increasing hum from the batteries drown him out. I move the wizard back into the pentagram. Quite how, I'm not sure. The golden light in the room has increased so much that I have to shade my eyes. I can see that the demon has got John, holding him to his chest. I can see at least three of the tentacles piercing John's body, his blood falling to the floor to hiss and bubble alongside the saliva. The banishment spell is nearing its end. 
Blue bolts of electricity are crackling around the room. John is dead. I can see that. The demon is moving towards me, still cradling John's body. The batteries have started to screech. I think of you and the kids just as the banishment spell ends. There's a blast of golden light which drives all further thought from my head. Tape number 11, 2.30 p.m., August 11th, 2045. That's all, really. I woke up on the asthma of this morning, and apart from the severe headache, there seems to be no after effects. The general came to see me, and after exchanging some insincere pleasantries, he helped me fill in the parts which I'd blanked on. When the golden flash came, he was on the floor, just getting to his feet after being sandbagged by John. He turned away from the window so he didn't see what happened, but by the time he reached the door, the room had been scoured. There was no trace of the pentagram or of John's body. The whole room looked as if it had just been cleaned. He's very pleased with the results of our experiment. The batteries are fully charged and he intends to go ahead with the Mars trip. He was suitably contrite about the deaths of John and Dean, of course, but he still believes that there is a scientific rationale. He thinks we have tapped into a tremendous energy potential and says that he intends to press for further experimentation. I told him that I'd fight him, but the look in his eyes showed me all I needed to know. To the military eye, the experiment was a success. He has already won. They took me to the viewing port to see the pole decaying depart. We had to have full filters on the windows as it spun off across the sky, streaming golden light in a long comet tail behind it. It was night on Earth below. Millions of people will have seen a new star. I need to see you, hug you. I need you to bring me back to reality, to reassure me that I have done no wrong. I keep thinking of something John said. Great Cthulhu has slept for millennia, but when the stars are right, he will awaken and chaos will walk the skies. I wonder if the stars are right out there in the vastness, out towards Mars. Ends. Author's Note When the Stars Are Right came from a mixture of Ghostbusters, Lovecraft, and 50s sci-fi movies, all of which I love intensely. This one ran in my head like a movie, and it felt like the main character was narrating it straight at me. It was written overnight in one sitting over smokes and coffee while I was supposedly at work waiting for a long, boring batch job to run on a mainframe. I love the retro feel of it and would love to see it made into a black and white Outer Limits style short. Okay, welcome back. Thanks for listening to the story. Hope you enjoyed it. And thank you, Mr. Meekle, for sending it our way. If you're an author and you have a story you'd like to submit to the Doonstief, how would they go about doing that, Rish? They could send it in the body of an email to submissions at doonstief.com. And uh, if they want to just look on the website, which is www.doonstief.com, they can read our submission guidelines. Yeah, that's right. Nice work. Hey, you know, I, I, I got to interrupt, man. Uh, how many published novels did this guy say he had? I think he said nine. Nine. And last week, the guy was in college, right? Right. And how many short stories had he had sold? I think he said 20. Dude, uh, oh wait, OT, cue the sad music, please. Uh, mm. Dude, this guy is 14 years old, and he's published 126 short stories and nine novels in 143 languages, including dead languages. It's, it's just not fair, man. I, I keep writing these stories, and I keep thinking that they're good and all that, and nothing is published, and I'm not mm-hmm. going anywhere, and someday I aspire to live in my parents' basement, and... You know, I'm hoping to have a roof over my head so I can hang myself. Right now, you know, being homeless, it's really hard to do that. It's just... <sighs> you, you feel better? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. No, now I feel bad again. Mm. All right. So uh, if you have a comment about today's story or any of the previous stories that we've run on the Steve Audio Fiction Magazine... You could visit our website, www.dunesteef.com. That's D-U-N-E-S-T-E-E-F. Wow. Yeah, how about that? And you could leave a comment right there on the blog, or you could email us a comment at editor at And also, we pay our authors. 
We do. We send them money for their stories. If you would like to send us a donation, it doesn't have to be big, it doesn't have to be small either, but <laughs> there's a PayPal link right there on the site. You can click it. You can donate whatever you feel like, and that money would be very much appreciated. And imagine if you were to have clicked on that button, what, what, what could someone say if they did that? I mean, that would be... They'd be able to say, I, I press, press the, the button. button. <laughs> That's right. Well, hey, here we are at the end of October. I can't believe how fast it's gone by. I, yeah. I feel like I've been robbed. Uh, I challenged you guys, uh, it, the robot too, at the beginning of the month to uh, participate in my annual October Scary Story event, which is basically you write a scary story. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't even have to be good if my story is an indication. <laughs> and uh, you've got to have it done by the 31st of October. Right. And uh, so I just wondered, uh, how are you or is, is doing? Well, uh, it took me a really long time to get going. I mean, all the That's way... what she said. <laughs> all the way back at just a few days ago, like the 22nd, I still had barely gotten past the first page. But I, I uh, stepped it up, and I'm almost done, hopefully before midnight of the 31st. And you, hey, I noticed that a couple of people have already submitted uh, scary stories for us. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we got a submission from uh, a guy who goes by the name of R080T. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, I actually took a look at it and read it through already. You, you did a good job, 080T. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, I liked it. It was, it was good stuff. Uh, really well-rounded characters. Uh, you know, the whole bit, and it was so scary. But, you know, the the one thing that I was thinking, oh, O8OT, I don't think that Rish could have still been screaming with the entire contents of his rib cage removed and him standing there holding it in his hands. I, I don't know if that's totally realistic. Wait a second. Is this some, is this some offensive story about me dying or being tortured or... You, you don't need to worry about it. It's, it's, it's a good story. It's all right. And it ends well. I mean, me and 08 OT get out just fine. Keep those cards and letters coming. <laughs> <laughs> ah. So if you haven't started yet. It's too bloody late. Yeah, you're probably too late. But uh, hopefully uh, you have started already and, and you're almost done and you had a good time writing yourself a scary story in the month of October. And if you didn't manage to get one out, well, we'll be back again next year, hopefully, as long as they haven't shut down the Dunes Thief by then. And we'll have another October Scary Story event for you to participate in. So you could start thinking now, what is that wonderful idea that I'm going to send to the Dunes Thief next year? Uh, anyhow, October's still going. Greatest month of the year. I love Halloween. I love horror. I love horror stories. Just love all the costumes in the stores. L lots of movies in the theater right now. Scary movies. Not all of them good, but uh, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about movies because uh, this week my cousin and I sat down and we watched The Scorpion King 2, colon, Rise of the Neanderthal. Or something. I, I don't Scorpion know what it is. Scorpion King 2 was a, a sequel to The Scorpion King 1, right? Right. Which is a sequel... Uh, which is a spin-off of Mummy Returns, which was a sequel, sequel to, to The Mummy, which uh, was a remake of the old Universal that's a, that's Mummy movies. That's a strange and twisted family tree that that movie has. And Yeah, and as far as I know, nobody involved in Scorpion King 2 even saw Scorpion King 1, let alone had anything <laughs> to do with it. But anyhow, I, I was going somewhere. Really? The, no. I'm just I'm deliberately wasting your time. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to shoot you. <laughs> the the point of the movie was well there was no point in the movie. But at one point in the movie, they have to go into the labyrinth where the Minotaur is, you know. Sounds scary. No, I, it has nothing to do with October. I, it was oh. just a really really bad It sounds segue. scary to have to sit through. Yes, that it was. Oh, terrifying. So they go into this labyrinth and they keep talking about the Minotaur and their people. Nobody has survived who's seen the Minotaur and all that. Mm -hmm. And just from the production values and the overall low quality of this film, I had a bad feeling about this Minotaur. And I said to my cousin, dude, if that Minotaur is not CG, I'll give you $5. And he said, no. And I said, no, 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 no strings attached. Just if the Minotaur is 
a guy in a suit or a prosthetic or animatronic or stop motion, I'll give you five dollars. And wouldn't buy it. He wouldn't take the deal. I I don't understand, but that's fine. Anyhow, they finally show the Minotaur. And it was just a guy with this awful headpiece thing on it. It was so bad, but still better than if it had been CG. <laughs> I was surprised that it wasn't CG. I mean, shoot, the Backyardigans is all CG. You would think that. Dude, I have grown to hate CG. Yeah. I'm just, I'm like my mother who would, she'd be like, oh, golly, why do they have to have so much swearing in these movies? It's like, why is the language so foul in these movies? And I, I appreciate my mom for coming in and, and giving us that sound bite. And, that, and it was just one of those things where I'd roll my eyes and I'd be like, you know, it's, it's PG-13. Or I'd say, you know, that's how people talk. Or they're trying to make a point that he's in no position to raise a kid. Or, you know, these are the bad guys or, or whatever the deal uh-huh. is. And all that. And she's like, no, no, it was so much better before. Dude, I, I have become my mother. Oh, movie special effects were so much better before CG, and there's nothing worse than a bad CG effect. The, the, the other true. day, uh, Tyrannus and I were watching Angel, and there was a CG Angel for the first time I'd ever seen it. It was just so jarring. There had been four years of this show without a single CG Angel, and suddenly he's there, and it just, yeah, it was like a slap in the face from 2004. What the hell is wrong with you people? So I called you up. And I said, I want to talk about bad special effects. Why don't you tell me what your thought is? I don't know if I'll be able to get as fired up as you about it, but I definitely have to agree now that it's so readily available. It's just gotten to the point where you're just like, oh, somebody give me a break. Cinema's been around for 100 years. That's slightly over 100 now. And we went 80-something years without computer animation, without computer-generated special effects. And you watch like some of those old Hitchcock flicks or the old Orson Welles movies where they had to be innovative. Man. And it seems like now that we have this easy, cheap tool in our hands that nobody's creative anymore. Nobody feels the yeah. need to come up with something clever. And Okay, I think both of us got Iron Man last week or whenever it came out. And if you have that documentary about the making of, they show Stan Winston, his, his effects company, making these suits. The Iron Man suit or the big uh, version one. Or they even did like part of the Iron Monger suit for Jeff Bridges to wear. And, right. and you look at how unbelievably realistic these things are. and But yet people can interact with them. And they have actual physical tactileness to these, right. to these suits. I, I remember I was at Comic-Con and they showed all this footage edited together from the film. And they had just wrapped the shoot like three weeks before or two weeks before. And yet they had finished sequences because they had actually had a guy in a suit. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, I just I felt like I, it might be fun to rant just to give a couple of bad special effects. And then in honor of Iron Man, while they were showing that, that documentary, they showed Stan Winston's studio. And you could see like the alien queen that he had made. And you could see Pumpkinhead. And you could see the Predator. And you could see the, the Velociraptors and stuff that, that were actual right. tangible. They were still there from all these, these years. And, and they're, those suckers are never going to look any faker than they did the day they came out in the theater. Man. Right. Um, so I'll just go first. Bad special effects. And I'm sure you didn't put this one. Okay. Malbosia in Spawn. Now, do you remember the end of Spawn and they were talking about this big demon thing? I, I never understood why a creature like that was so lame because it's hard to make people look realistic or it's hard to make environments that people are interacting with. Right. But this was like some monster in hell with flames all around it and its mouth didn't even move. And it just, it, it was, wow, I don't even have words. Well, you know, the whole movie was really lame. Yeah. But do you remember that thing I, at the end? I think I do. I think I do remember that. I, I, I tried to block most of that movie out of my memory, but... Wow. And I, I dug it up. Oh, it looked really, really bad. And he just sat there and he just kind of had it. Well, mouth. it was supposed to be talking and it was, it was... I don't know if it was a puppet. It doesn't matter. These, these special effects don't have to be CG. Right. They had made a cape for Spawn that was CG. Mm-hmm. And you could tell it wasn't real. But at least it looked like, wow, that's interesting. It's like some supernatural living cape kind right. of thing. But no. The, the demon just plain sucked. Yeah. Okay. Since you kind of mentioned um, how it's hard to do people, 
in CG. I'll go ahead and go to one of my first uh, bad effects. In, in one of the granddaddies of them all of uh, CG effects, there was the best picture, most money makingest film of all time, Titanic, which was just loaded, chock full of CG shots. And they had this one shot, and it's pretty early on in the movie. The, the ship has just recently uh, left uh, Britain, and it's heading you know, across the ocean. And they have, you know, the, the music's playing and the helicopter shot. The shot's flying up and it's soaring up over the boat and it's flying around and you're seeing all these amazing, you know, shots of this huge ship and all this stuff. And there's people moving around on there and the, basically they're switching to another scene where the captain is talking about something. So they're coming in on where the captain is standing. As they come in on where the captain is standing, there's a person walking up to the captain and then they cut to real people, and this person says something to the captain. This person walking up to the captain in this long CG shot looks so awful. He moves so strange. His knees are all bouncing strangely. He looks like one of those dolls off of the uh, Christmas specials that you get, you know, like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer or... Uh, like um, the Heat Miser, that kind of stuff. Right. Not talking about that wizard guy from uh, Santa Claus is Coming to Town? Anyways, you know. Those. I'm sure I don't know. Um, so, yeah, that shot, you know, everything in that movie. And the movie was really good. The special effects were amazing the entire way through. And sure, there's going to be some that uh, pop out because they had so many effects in that show that something had to pop out. But, yeah, that bit. The, the worst part about bad effects is that suddenly your suspension of disbelief is gone. And you pop out and you're like, oh, I'm not in a story. I'm sitting here in a theater watching pictures projected on a screen. or you know, It just kills movies when that happens. That's the worst part. Okay, so my, uh, my second bad special effect, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if we were on your list, is the plane crash in Air Force One. Yeah, that was my second too. I guess we oh, really? That. Okay. <laughs> well, I really liked Air Force One. But then there was this terrible ultra phony FX shot at the end and it not only took me out of the movie but it may have actually ruined yeah. the movie you and I may have seen it together or we both went around the same time and I said Harrison Ford has to have connections at ILM or something <laughs> could I mean, dude could what a terrible a terrible it looks so awful yeah, it's that suspension of disbelief lost again. You're like, oh, yeah, this is just a movie. It, there'd been nothing like that up to that yeah. point, right? The whole I, it show was all was believable. It was all in a set, and then suddenly, hey, we're using this terrible effect shot. And it was another one of those where they went with CG, where you didn't have to do CG. Seriously. You drop a model into a swimming pool, and it's got to look better <laughs> than that, no? Totally. And even if they just plain didn't show it. I mean, seriously, it really ruined the movie. That one shot ruined the whole movie. The Let me also add the witch in Blair Witch Project. <laughs> Worst special effect. Of, well, I'm, I'm not really sure if that counts. Okay, so since you already used my number two, I'm going to just, I guess, jump ahead to number three. And uh, I just had to, I mean, I know these effects were really good, and yet I hated A, Jar Jar Binks in the new prequel movies, and B, Yoda in the new prequel movies. And I don't know if this was a fault of the effects or what, but A, Jar Jar Binks appeared to be made of rubber. He was just weird. He bounced around, moved strangely. It was like Bugs Bunny or maybe Daffy Duck when he gets really excited and goes, woo, 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 woo. You know, he was that way the whole entire time. And it's just like, okay, this effect doesn't look real to me, you know? We should die in here. <laughs> or Yoda, who was a similar thing in the uh, second film. And it, I think it's one of the things that makes the second film as despised as it is, is when Yoda suddenly turns into this leaping, flying, spinning, jumping, crazy thing. The guy who walks with a cane is bouncing all off the walls and off the ceiling and everywhere else. Um, it was like Roger Rabbit when he gets upset and starts bouncing around the room. Anyways... 
Yeah, those two characters in those films really irritated me. And maybe I should also include those big fat cow things from the second film. The ticks? <laughs> Whatever they were. The one that freaking Anakin like gets on top of and rides down the thing. Those things are just ugly and awful and stupid. But that, that, they weren't poorly done. They were just <laughs> awful. I <laughs> just hated them. <laughs> just hated them. Well, my number one bad special effect is a cousin to yours. And it is... Jabba the Hutt in the Star Wars Ooh. Special Edition. This Ooh, is my all-time most hated special effect, CG or otherwise. I don't understand how the world's foremost effects company, who pioneered CG, could so blow it. And then they dared to tout it, to promote it in the trailer. <laughs> Dude, if they made the T-Rex in Jurassic Park look exactly like the robot T-Rex, you know, like the model. They made the CG one look like the model, and it jumps, and it, it, it stalks and leaps and eats other dinosaurs mm -hmm. totally realistically. Why couldn't they make this, this, this mostly sedentary Job of the Hut look like the 1983 model from Return of the Jedi – or even close nice. to the, the model from a Return of the Jedi, or even the same species as the creature in Return of the Jedi. I always quote Star Trek First Contact whenever anybody talks to me about, about mm -hmm. that Jabba. You know, Picard says, that was nothing I could do. And Lily says, you didn't even try. <laughs> that was uh, quite a rant. Wow, that was an essay. You weren't kidding. Because, dude, they didn't even try. You didn't even try. Dude, you know that company could do it. Where was your involved sensibility then? Yeah, you know they could pull it they off. They could, and uh, dude, why in the frick would they have him stomp on Jabba the Hutt? He steps on him, and Jabba goes, oh my god. And people praised that. They were like, wow, what a clever oh, what way to go. What an interesting idea. Oh, yeah, that's right. Jabba would have him executed right then and there. Okay, so maybe they should have tried something else. And you were the one that was told me, I think that they should have done with that movie in the same way they first introduced the Emperor in Empire Strikes Back as they did, you know, the little blue hologram. So why don't they just have some hologram droid thing floating above where Jabba the Hutt's supposed to be projecting down a little blue Jabba the Hutt as he says all these things. And then Han, what does he do? He walks through the hologram. Doesn't matter. It's just a hologram. But no, n not with a real Jabba. He has to step on him and do a goofy, uh, that awful... Awful thing. Uh, please don't use the, the words real Jabba when referring to the special edition. Sorry. <laughs> but no, dude, that wasn't me. That or, wasn't or if it was me, I've forgotten. But huh. what a great idea. What a much better idea. And mm. I remember that I heard they were kicking around, and it could be you know Star Wars purists or apologists trying to make up for it, that they were considering having Jabba on some kind of floating platform. That would have been a little But I mean, it still would have been better. I, I just... I, seriously... A, he's a third the size that he is in Return of the Jedi. Uh -huh. Two, he's not the same color. Three, not the same shape. He has those freakish eyes. <sighs> those eyes are so and, freakish. <sighs> They're worse, I think, even than the eyes of the kids on the uh, Polar Express. <laughs> Okay, well, hey, then, if, if we're going to talk about good special effects, I'll just start right off to cl cleanse the palate and say Jabba the Hutt in Return of the Jedi. Okay. Because that just gets the bad taste of that special edition out of my mouth. <laughs> now, I've seen, and you maybe too, have seen how they did that with the little people in the costume, right, you know, and, and, and the levers. And, and dude, it's amazing. I, I've seen that. I've seen the actual people that worked it get in position and the guy who ran the tongue pretend that he has a tongue. And all that. And, and even having seen that, when I watch Return of the Jedi, which is absolutely the most underrated of all the Star Wars yeah. movies, I forget about that. I forget that I've seen it in person. I forget that I've seen the making of. And I just accept that Jabba is real yeah. in the way that stormtroopers are real or Chewbacca is real or Leia in that metal bikini is real. <laughs> yeah, that, that kind of crosses over into one of mine. Um, this was actually going to be my number one of all time. The best effects there are are those practical effects that uh, they used in Star Wars. And I have uh, other examples. You know, I said Jabba the Hutt, but also Yoda from the, the original trilogy. He's, he's really cool looking. Really, it looks like a real thing. 
you don't look at that and think, oh, that's just some crappy Muppet. You know, he looks like a real, actual creature that moves around. You see his feet. You see everything. He's really cool. He doesn't seem like he's just Kermit the Frog um, repainted or something. And on top of that, and I know there are some shots that didn't work out so well, but with the Rancor, Rancor is really cool and really scary. It looked like this gigantic thing when it was really some tiny little model. And there are some shots where the leg walks by and the mat didn't blend so well. But all the same, I believe that so much more than Jar Jar Binks bouncing around like freaking Fraggle on crack. That's the last thing Misa wants. <laughs> Fraggle on crack. <laughs> they were just so much better. And the explosions of the Death Star, too. You know, before they added in that goofy little the thing. The Praxis Moon yeah, the, thing. The, what do they call that? The, yeah, before they added in that shockwave thing. The, the original one, you know, it's just like a, a little explosion. But holy cow, in Return of the Jedi, and I remember seeing the making of where they have these, the big model, and they shut off this explosion, and the explosion's over in like a second. But they had the thing running at such high speed, the camera, that they get this amazing explosion. It goes boom, and it comes out, and you got the ships fleeing in front of the explosion. It just looks so great. Have you heard that, I mean, it was such a massive explosion that it, like, wreaked havoc with the Endor moon and killed all the Ewoks, gave them all cancer and stuff. And, <laughs> yeah, you know, three years later, all the Ewoks had died and they, they were peeing blood and stuff. I don't know if you've heard that. The, the Ewoks probably deserve that anyway. So. <laughs> a lot um, of people don't like the Ewoks. Sorry. So that, that's, that's actually my number one. But since you mentioned Jabba, I, I just kind of skipped ahead to that. So you can go ahead and, and read your next one, and I'll, I'll read some other. I didn't mean to, yeah, to rearrange it all your up, but whatever. Uh, okay, so my next one is the T-1000 on the helicopter in Terminator 2. The the shot where he jumps up into the helicopter and uses his head to smash through and he pours through and into the seat and then forms into the T-1000. What astounded me about that shot was that you could see the real pilot, the real actor yeah. reflected in his skin. And he, he was interacting with this being... I had never seen anything like that. Yeah, cool stuff. Now, you and I, we watched that just this yeah, year, just, in 2008. Just, uh, yeah, just the other... And those shots were still totally believable, yeah, right? They are. CG tends to date, I think, faster than models or prosthetics yeah. or guys in a costume or any of that stuff. But I don't think any of that was dated. So the next one on my list, this is actually from a TV show, if you can believe that. There's this shot from Battlestar Galactica, which always has really good special effects. Except for the Cylons. Except for the Cylons most of the time. But sometimes even they are good. But uh, it always has great special effects, especially the space shots, which I'm pretty sure are all CG. And they'll do s some great stuff. Like as time goes by, that ship looks more and more and more hammered. But there was a shot. In season three, when they're all stuck on the planet in New Caprica, and they're, they're coming to rescue them now. They've finally uh, decided it's time to end this occupation. And Battlestar Galactica is coming back to get these people. They're dropping all these ships in. And there's this simply amazing shot where the Battlestar Galactica itself jumps into out of space, atmosphere. jumps into the atmosphere. It appears only a little bit above the ground. There's flame coming off of this all over the ship. You see as it's coming through the atmosphere and right there. Holy crap, was that shot amazing. And I think when we went and saw Kevin Smith, and he was the moderator at the Battlestar Galactica panel. Right. He mentioned he that shot that, he? and even said uh, some dirty language about it, which, of course, is all he does is say dirty language. So that's not a surprise. But yeah, Why he, does that... there have to be profanity <laughs> at Kevin Smith's question and answers? I... But yeah, it, that shot was just so awesome. And it's just crazy to think that that was on a TV show. So my next one is... And boy, there were so many to choose from from this saga. But I'm going to go with the Oliphant battle at the end of Return of the King. Mm. Now, I nearly said Gollum in the Two Towers. But I kind of remember having to suspend my disbelief yeah. and just accept that he was there, that he was fighting and mm. all that with the... With with Frodo and and it was a little early in uh, you know making an actual character versus well he's he's great and he he is probably the best CG character ever yeah I'd agree with that but when when 
all of those guys were fighting and there's the winged creatures fighting and, and th things being crushed and dropped. And on. Is it the Pelennor Fields where this fight happens? I didn't have to suspend anything. You know, I just believed it. It was just, it was great stuff. Yeah, I totally agree. Getting back to my list, I have on here the effects from Apollo 13. And they're really amazing shots. You look at them, and they look so good. You see some of these close-up shots. Like of the rocket. As the rocket's going up, and you see the tiles shaking off of the thing as it goes. And you see, like, the dust and, like, the, the steam that you see or whatever it is coming off of the rocket boosters and all that kind of stuff. Just really nice-looking stuff. But a, a really interesting thing is uh, way back when that movie was fairly new, I read an interview with uh, Ron, Ron Howard. Howard, and he was talking about when they showed, they premiered this film, and some of the astronauts that were actually from that mission were present at the uh, screening, and he was talking with one of them afterwards, and the guy was saying, wow, you know, that was some really good stuff. You know, you had some stuff in there, some, some footage in there that I'd never seen before. Where did you guys come up with that footage? Was it archival footage? The astronaut actually believed that it was real film from the actual launch, because they did actually use some film from, you know, the actual thing, and, and then they interspersed in this CG stuff that was good enough that the astronaut that was on the mission believed it to be real. I don't know. I think that's pretty impressive. He but, goes uh, over and says, Ron, that was so much cooler than it actually was. <laughs> wow, man. That's right. I wish that there had been that much fire. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I don't know if this is an urban legend, but, you know, in Austin Powers, where the JB's big boy does that shot mm -hmm. of it shooting up in the rocket, I have heard that that's actually the Apollo 13 rocket launch, and they have superimposed the JB's oh, big yeah. boy over it, huh. which, if, if so, that's really clever. Okay, so next on my list, Jurassic Park, mm -hmm. the reveal of the first dinosaur when they go over the hill and there's the Brachiosaurus, I believe it is. I wanted to say Brontosaurus, but I think it's Brachiosaurus. Yeah, I think it is Brachiosaurus. That's up there and its neck and it's got the top of the tree and that. Now, I had never seen anything like that. And I never saw a trailer for Jurassic Park. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I was in prison and all that, so I didn't That's get right. to see. I, the first time I saw any footage from Jurassic Park was in Jurassic Park. And so that was just jaw-dropping. Yeah. Then they cut to the really, really wide shot of the island, and you see... Oh, just tons of them. Tons so. of them. They're all over, and they're running all over the place. You, you get the same wonder yourself seeing this as the characters in the film. You know, these people who have studied dinosaurs all their lives, and suddenly now they're seeing real dinosaurs. You feel like that same feeling almost from seeing just these shots and how real and cool they look. For me, man, it's almost the opposite of the suspension of disbelief when I saw that, because my first inclination was, holy crap, that is a dinosaur. That's a real dinosaur. And right. then I had to say, no, 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 no. Somehow that's pretend. Oh my gosh. You know, it's kind real, of thing. it's real. But anyways... <laughs> <laughs> Very recently, we watched uh, some documentaries about the making of Superman. And uh, the effect that I just wanted to talk about is just Superman flying on that film. So realistic and wonderful. And they all that they said about that in the documentary, just how Im amazingly hard it was to get it to look right. It just looked like crap every time they did it. And they finally figured out how a way to get it to work and to look nice and it made the film turn from, you know, this thing's going to be a B-movie and it's going to come out and it's going to be like Scorpion King Part 2 and three people are going to see it. It went from that to one of the greatest movies of all time, Superman did. And it was all because they were able to make those effects work. I don't know. It's just one of those effects that it made a movie that I really like something worth watching, <laughs> which it probably wouldn't have been if, you know, every time Superman flies, you go, oh, dude... That sucks. You, well, you got to wonder how that movie would have turned out had Guy Hamilton directed it or had Richard Donner just said, screw it, man. This is way too much work with the, the flying thing. We're just going to do blue screen or we're just going to do wires on them or, or whatever kind of thing. You see Superman 4, which had no budget at all. Right. And yeah, they actually have drawings of Superman flying around in that. You're just like, whoa, man. Oh, did, you, did, you, did he just become a cartoon? Well, dude, Superman, I, I don't know when the last time I watched it was, whether it was this year or last year, but there's not a moment in that where the flying looks fake. Yeah, really nice. Okay, dude. Okay, so we're on my last one. 
It was, it was hard. I had to come up with the most amazing special effect in all the movies I've ever seen. And I'm narrowing it down to the AT-AT battle in Empire Strikes yeah. Back. I used to work at a video store also, and I would watch that before the special edition came out. And then after the special edition came out, I would still watch that. And I'd just be amazed, astounded, blown away. That and the asteroid chase that comes later. Right. But that I'd be astounded that it could have been made in 1979 or 80, you know, rather than 96 or, or, or 2000 or 2008 or 2011 or whenever it is. Uh, now, nitpickers claim that you can see the mat lines or you can see through the snow speeder uh, cockpit. Dude. Yeah, there's always nitpickers. And you can complain about those effects, but for their day, they were freaking absolutely amazing. I mean, they would look good coming out in a film now. Yeah, that's yeah. You don't need to say for their day, dude, because that the, so the, the walkers day, just out of out of control and the snow speeders and the explosions and and the the, the hoth landscape and all that is just it's it. I defy you not to watch that if it happens to be on in a store, you know, on some demo or or just clicking through the channels, kind of thing. I don't I don't know that it is possible. I mean, it would be like a really really hot girl walking down the street and her skirt blows up. I defy <laughs> you not to look, kind of thing, and. You know, I like King Kong, I like Ray Harryhausen, but those walkers are the best stop motion ever, ever in film. Man, I just, oh, I, 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 I adore the yeah. Imperial you know, walker scene. My son grew up as a Star Wars fan just because I was a Star Wars fan and I kind of pushed it on him. But uh, for the longest time, every time he'd want to watch Star Wars... Be like, okay, which one do you want to watch? He'd say, I want to watch the ad at one. I want the ad at one because even at two years old, he's going, wow, this is amazing. Say, <laughs> you know, right as young as that, he already recognizes great stuff when he sees it. And Sounds like your I'm, kid has taste. Yeah, I'm sure uh, when he's even as old as you. You sad music. As old and alone. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think my son's going to be alone like you. I'm sorry. But when he's as old as you, he will still, I, I'm sure, want to see that film again because of how amazing the uh, effects are. I want to see that film again right now. Let's I go just... watch it. We need to end this podcast. We'll go watch it. <laughs> okay, so that sounds like uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah, when... I think things are running down. It's time for the hate letter of the week. Oh, yeah, it is. You do it. You do it. Please. Okay. I think I think it is my turn last time because we did Rochambeau last time. Oh, jeez. You, you know, as much as it hurt, it hurt more the next morning. Oh. I got out of bed, and then I just got right back in bed. <laughs> but how was that different than the day before? <laughs> uh, you know me too well. <laughs> okay. Hello, Dune Steefers. Oh, that's cute. This isn't really a hate letter because I don't really hate you guys. Wow, really? Well, that's a nice change. I really dislike you both, especially Rish, but I'm trying to work on anger issues and embracing my fellow man, and I'm having a lot of success. Okay, I guess I do hate Rish, but I think people would forgive me for that if they ever met him. Sorry, man. Anyway, I didn't want to criticize you two so much as praise R-O-8-O-T, who answers your mail. He and I have exchanged some emails, and I think he's intelligent, clever, and delightful in conversation. Unlike some... Wow, he capitalized some. I want to congratulate him for his promotion to co-host, and tell him I think he does a great job. And I always appreciate his witty comments, especially when he tells Rish what he can do with himself. Hey, 8 t this is just for you. Zero zero one one zero one one zero one zero zero one one zero zero one. I don't get it. Anyways, finishes off your pal Cody Judy. Um, Keep those cards and letters coming, folks. Yeah. Okay, it looks like our show's wound down. Uh, we need to go watch Empire Strikes Back anyway. Oh, yes. So, um, we're gonna go ahead and head out. Uh, we'd like to thank you all real fast for, for listening, and uh, we'd like to thank again William Meikle for his story. Hey, as always, this has been Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. In this town, we call home. Everyone hail to the pumpkin song. La 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 la
Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Told Tales Tales presents presents an eight-part audio blockbuster. The epic tale of a mild-mannered comic book fan who accidentally kills his favorite superhero, then must assume his identity to save the world. Oh my god! I killed Awesome Man! You must become the next Awesome Man. Me? I I don't have any superpowers. He doesn't have any regular powers. What the hell are you wearing? It's my new alter ego, Commander Badass! No way, dude. I can't take care of myself, let alone a sidekick. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Commander Badass is your partner, not a sidekick. Four extremely powerful beings are approaching our world. Real-life horsemen of the apocalypse. Wait, what? Starring Norm Sherman of the Drabblecast and featuring celebrity appearances by Mer Lafferty. Who is that? Seth. Harwood. Kick him in the nuts. Matthew Wayne sells The aliens are closing in. Rick Stringer. Get him out of there. Soup Bone, the Wonderpin. He's about to be red, bled, and dead. J.C. Hutchins. Mommy. And Stephen Ely. Sweet mother of God. Available August 25th on welltoldtales.com and I killed awesome man.com.